I want to begin a new series, and I encourage you to take out the notes, and you can doodle on them. I've never done anything quite like this before, nor quite like this message this morning. And I'm, I've entitled our series, Building My House on the Rock. Now, I'm not much of a builder. We have builders in the house. Eddie Margo's a great builder. We got other builders around. I'm now in trouble because I forgot you. Uh, Steve McGuffey, I got you. And we got great builders around. And they know you got to put a good foundation on the house. And those are the words of Jesus about living our life. If you want to live a life that's healthy and strong, then uh, build your house, your life, on the rock. On the rock. Jesus said this almost 2,000 years ago. He said, those who hear me and do what I say are like these intelligent, those intelligent people. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are an intelligent person. I just believe you are. Jesus said, those who hear me and do, everybody say do, do. and do what I say are like those intelligent people who build their homes on solid rock, where rain and floods and winds cannot shake them. So I want to talk to you through the next month on building our house on the rock. Now next Sunday, don't miss, because our dear friend, Pastor Roger Wong, pastor of City Impact Church, will be here. He's coming in next Sunday morning, August 4th, and uh, you won't want to miss uh, Pastor Roger sharing out of his life message. And by the way, uh, the 1st of September, Roger's life story, his biography is coming out in a, a book, and you can go ahead online and order. It's, uh, I think it's called Chasing God, and uh, written by, it was uh, co-authored with Susanna Foth Ottman, and some of you know Dick Foth, so Susanna is Dick's daughter, so she wrote the book. And uh, Pastor Rogers, a dear friend of ours, and now we're famous too because his book's coming out. Yeah. <laughs> That's how it works. You just stand close to fame and you get, it rubs off. <laughs> About a month ago, I started hearing comments, and that's what stirred me to do this series. Hopefully, I can get going here and get it rolling, but I want to encourage you to listen. About a month ago, I started hearing, you know, um, the Old Testament, the first two-thirds mostly of this book called the Bible, the Old Testament doesn't count anymore. What's written in the Old Testament was under a different, uh, a different time, a different dimension than where we're living, and so whatever's written in the Old Testament can't be applied to us today. I kind of scratched my head on that one, so I said, well, we're, we need to tackle that. Because that is absolutely not true. If we decide we're going to throw out the first two-thirds, then we've got to throw out the rest of it too. So they said, uh, the Old Testament doesn't have anything to say. And then another comment I heard was, um, you know, Jesus doesn't say anything. And in this case, uh, the, co the topic was uh, because it was right in the middle of uh, our nation and our leadership and our, uh, our Supreme Court acknowledging um, same-sex marriages. So the other comment I heard was Jesus didn't have anything to say about sexuality and in particular about homosexuality. And I went, <clears throat> that's not true either. Um, no matter what people tell you, and uh, there are many people that are very religious and they will tell you many things. So hopefully in the next month I will have a message on uh, what would I say to my friend that's engaging in homosexuality. So uh, how many would like to hear that message? Uh, I figured I'd just draw you out with the titles anyway. Um, I would like to ask everybody in the room that is single, you're not married, maybe you're widowed, uh, whatever your age, I'm not talking just about young people, I'm just saying single, if you are single, and I know uh, some of you are older, single, and single, you don't take that as a label for you, but you, you're, you're not married uh, you uh, are going it, so to speak, alone. Maybe you're young people, maybe you're old people, maybe you're somewhere in between, but you are here today and you're single. Would you just stand right quick? Would you do that? Stand. Come on. Everybody stand. Stay standing. Stay standing. Keep standing. Keep standing. Come on, stand. Everybody keep standing. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Keep standing. Keep standing. St don't sit down. Keep standing. 
Thanks, Craig. Don't sit down, Raymond. Don't sit down. Keep standing, because your standing will encourage somebody else. Now, this is the middle of the summer, and we have a lot of people gone, but uh, all of you married folks, isn't it remarkable to... Uh, Jose, what are you doing? Jose, are you... You're not married. He's going like this. No rings. So get off your seat. Get on your feet. Let's go. So I wanted you to look around because those of us, we don't see life as it is. We see life as we are. So if you're married, you think married is the... It's, it's the but look how many wonderful people we have as a part of our church family. You may be seated. Thanks, Jose. Jose is on the third row right here. Pointing him out right there. <laughs> because in the next month, Lord willing, I want to give a message particularly to those, I want to talk about the single reality. I want to talk, what's God say to you if you're single? Are you leftovers and left out? And uh, so, by the way, all of you are married, go, oh, good, I won't have to come that day. <laughs> you need to come. You need to come. N- not next Sunday, though. And, and never mind. <clears throat> Another thing I began to hear in the last month was, uh, and it's not new, and none of these issues are new, but uh, people began to say, you know, is there really a hell? And uh, what does, uh, and, and uh, if God is really a God of love, how could there be a hell where he would send people to be separated from him for eternity and to suffer agony. And by the way, Jesus, again, is the authority, and he has much to say about hell. And we don't want to go there. We don't want anybody to go there. But uh, I want to kind of pick up on that maybe. Anyway, I won't cover everything, but I'm just kind of like laying the groundwork. Get it? Good. Now, if you can encourage people to come during this summer, uh, bring them, bring them, bring them. Today I want to talk about what do I do with the Bible. Now some of you have been sitting in church most of your life and this is not a question for you because you go, I got my Bible. How many here have uh, many Bibles at home? Could I see your hands? The Bible is the number one bestseller of all time. A guy by the name of, of Gutenberg developed a printing press. He did so because he wanted to print the Bible so people could have it in their hands and read it. Because many years went by where those of us who were the priests, we'd say, well, we'll read it for you, and we'll interpret it, and we'll tell you what we want you to know. But God wanted his word in the hands of everybody so they could read it personally. What does the Bible say? And you can read the Bible, and you can learn from it, and you can understand. And it is not a shot in the dark. The second verse on your outline says this. My people are destroyed. Circle the word my. Who would that be? My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being my priest. Now he's talking to the pastors, so that one's personal for me. So don't pick up on that one. And Doug, of course. Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being my priests. And because you have ignored the law of your God, I also will ignore your children. Circle the word knowledge. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. How many believe that you can know that this book is unique? How many think you can know that Jesus is a -a one-of-a-kind person? Not a guess, not a maybe, not a sort of, it could be, not a, you know, that happens to be your religion, but how many people think we can know? You know, we can know about certain things in this life more than many things that you already think you know. And we can know about Jesus, we can know, have knowledge about God through his word, we can have knowledge. We don't believe in a uh, life where we're just... Um, taking a giant leap of faith into the darkness. And people say, you know, Christianity is your crutch. It's not my crutch. Jesus is my life support, and he would be yours too. He is your only hope, Jesus Christ. My people are destroyed. How many have ever heard, we, we have a major disconnect 
uh, we have a major disconnect called truth decay. Now I went to the dentist recently, and my teeth are still pretty good, but they're kind of fading out after so many years. But uh, the greatest problem we have is truth decay, because we really don't know what God says and what he means. And so uh, how many have ever heard somebody say, what you don't know can't hurt you? <laughs> is that stupid or what? <laughs> what you don't know could kill you. you know? uh, I think I'll take a drink of water. That's not water. That's poison. You're going to die. Well, I didn't know that, so it can't hurt me. Or I think of my friend Dennis Rose and others that are pilots, and uh, they can be flying along in their plane and think that they're flying at a high enough altitude, but they're mistaken, and they run into the mountain. What you don't know could kill you. So my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, and many people today are being torn apart and destroyed because they do not know. Everybody say no. So where do we begin today? Look at the next verse on your outline. The whole Bible was given to us by inspiration from God and is useful to teach us what is true, circle the word true, versus false. It was useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong, circle the word wrong, in our lives, it straightens us out. <clears throat> I would venture to say that all of you in this room, except for me, you need to be straightened out a little bit. It straightens us out and helps us do, everybody say do, do. what is right. It is God's way, this is a, <clears throat> and is useful to teach us and to make us realize and it straightens us out and it helps us do what is right. Why? Why? Because it is God's way of making us well prepared at every point of our life. It's so that we can live life in the most meaningful, fulfilled way possible. Does that make sense? The purpose of God's Bible, of, of this unique book, is that we might have knowledge about God. That we might know. That we might know. Everything that was written in the past, the scriptures, Romans 15.4, was written to teach us. So this morning, in the minutes that I have remaining, I want to talk about three keys, three keys to the Bible. And this is like a fundamental, foundational, dr drill down deep, but uh, stay with me. I will nail you at the end. <laughs> three keys about the Bible. Here's the first key. And this will be the one probably I'll stay the longest on because it's, we need to be bolstered in our faith that what we have is knowing. We can know. So the first one is accept the authority of the Bible. To accept the authority of the Bible. To accept means to say yes, to say I believe. Authority is the power to influence because it's recognized as reliable knowledge. Authority. We have it on good authority. We have it and it's bad authority. In other words, they're not giving us a good report. You can know reliable, good authority, accept the authority of the Bible. That means that we consider this book, those of us that are followers of Jesus, that have been in the way, you don't have to start there when you come to Christ, but as you go along, you discover that this book is one of a kind. It is the only book like it. It was written over the course of 1,400 years, all of it except for one author, uh, over 40 different authors, um, all Jewish except for one. And that guy's name was Luke. He wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And he's the only non-Jewish person that wrote this. And so over 1,400 years, 40 authors, they wrote together, and nothing in the book contradicts itself. In fact, um, one person said, um, we don't... Uh, discount the Bible, disbelieve in the Bible because it contradicts itself. We don't believe in the Bible because it contradicts us. Should I say that again? Yeah. All right, let's see if I can do that and make sense of it. Um, it we don't, we're not believing in the Bible, not because it contradicts itself, but we don't believe in the Bible because it contradicts us. So uh, the Bible says... Do not lie. How many know that? Do you think that applies today? 
don't lie. I like the little girl who said, uh, this dad says, what's a lie? And she said, a lie is an abomination to God and a very present help in time of trouble. <laughs> Some of you will get that later. <laughs> but that's the way we live our life. We come up against something in this, and it's not where we're going, and it's not how we feel, and uh, we say, yep, I'm going this way, and uh, we don't take this to heart. This is knowledge right here. This book is unique, one of a kind, nothing close. First Thessalonians 2.13 says, we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, accepted it not as the word of men, but actually as it is, the Word of God. This book is not man's ideas about God. This is God's Word to us, God's direction to us. Now, we, we believe in a lot of authorities, but the Bible is the only good authority. But in our day, we have many unreliable authorities. Let me give you a few examples real quick. You can jot these down. They're not on your notes. The first one is culture. We take culture as our authority, I mean, just look around. Is it like uh, people are really uh, doing, they're dressing uniquely or they're um, fixing themselves up uniquely or is it kind of like we all follow each other in what we're doing and the way we look? And I look maybe like a pastor today because this is what pastors do. And, um, but we follow each other. We're greatly influenced. And in the Old Testament, it says, do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. <laughs> Mom said, well, what did you do that for, Dennis, when I was growing up? Because everybody was doing it, Mom. That's why we do it. A second unreliable authority is tradition. And Jesus spoke very firmly. He says, through your man-made traditions, you negate the word of God. And that's found in Mark 7, 8. Another way we, uh, un unreliable authority is reason. How many have thought you understood perfectly what was the right way to go and realized it was wrong? when you got through it. In Proverbs, it says there's a reason, there's a way that seems right to a pastor, but the end is death. There's a way that seems right to a person, but the end is death. Because we reason it out and go, uh, how many know you can reason it out and come up with exactly the wrong conclusion? You think you got, we do this all the time. When you hear a little gossip here, a little gossip there, and you put that together with that, and you think that's two plus two, and you got four, and so you go after the person that said it, and you, they go, what? Well, I reasoned it out that this must be this and this and this. So reason is unreliable as our authority. And then here's the number one of the age. Number one unreliable authority. It is the religion of our day. Feelings. Feelings. Nothing more than feelings. How can it be so right when it feels so wrong? How can it be so wrong when it feels so right? Um, feelings. Do you know that we live in the day of desires and pleasures? It is the number one religion of our day. Why did you do that? Because it feels good. And uh, why did you eat that ice cream last night, Dennis? You know your cholesterol is high because it feels good. Wow. Mm. Vanilla bean with a little chocolate on top. And then I really like it with bananas sliced in it too. I figured the bananas are healthy. They counteract the ice cream. The number one unreliable authority in our life is our feelings. How many know your feelings can ruin you? In Judges 21, 25, it says, everybody did what was right in their own eyes. I do what I think I feel is right, so I do it. You doing all right? Uh, I've... Uh, been studying for this for three weeks, so you have to sit here all day. It's going to be a long day. I'm trying to say that to encourage myself. <laughs> Luke, Luke, who is the, the physician, and uh, he wrote two books. In fact, his two books are the, create the most in the New Testament between Luke and Acts. He wrote the longest part of the New Testament. And Luke was the physician. He wrote his books about 60 to 63 A.D., about 30 years after Jesus was uh, walking on the earth, was crucified and rose again. 
within 30 years. He says, having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I have decided to write a careful account for you so you can be certain of the what? Truth of everything you were taught. So you can be certain of the truth. Now, if we're going to make the Bible our authority, you've got to answer four questions. I will do this quickly, and I will give you the answers. First question, does truth exist? Is there right and wrong? Really? Because people will tell you, and we live in the age of relative. It's all relative, you know. Uh, lying is the abomination of God and an ever-present help in time of trouble. It's all relative. I found myself in this awkward situation, and so it seemed convenient that I do not do what God said. Right? You follow me? So the first question is, does truth exist? And people will tell you, no, there are no absolutes. And then you, what do you say to them? Are you absolutely sure there are no absolutes? Because to say that everything is relative is, is, a, is not good thinking. It's not good thinking. It falls in on itself. It's like saying, uh, I only, um, it's like saying, my sisters were the only ones in my family. I mean, that's like, I'm not there. I'm in. And so, um, the fact of the matter is that truth does exist, and you base your life on it every day. Second question is, does God exist? That's a question. So first question, does truth exist? The answer is yes, and everybody that will take a moment and think about it, they all believe that it exists, that truth exists, especially when you apply it to them. Does God exist? Well, we're sitting here, it's Sunday morning, and we've been singing, Jesus, be the center of my life, and God, it's all about you, and you're omnipotent, and you're all powerful. So our answer to that question is yes, but is that good information? Yes. And uh, I can't spend a whole lot of time on it, but I did get a book this week that I thought you'd find interesting, and it's entitled, There is a God, and the subtitle is, How the World's Most Notorious Atheist Changed His Mind. Now, this was written by Anthony Flew, and uh, he is about, if he's still alive, this, was, this came out in 2007. He spent his entire lifetime, he's a famous writer and philosopher, and he spent 50 years plus of his life arguing for atheism. And in his later years, he said, it doesn't make sense. There had to be a start, and so he became what we call a deist. He believes that there is a God who is all-powerful, who is all-knowing, who is creative, who has a mind and started this whole thing we call life. And uh, this book is all about how he came to that conclusion. Now, this is a person that was, uh, in his 80s, he came to that conclusion. But he spent over 50 years of his life writing and defending atheism. And he came to the conclusion that that wasn't good thinking, that God does actually exist. And uh, so there is a God. And uh, this is challenging reading, but it's a good book and it's an uh, easy read. So um, does truth exist? Yes. Does God exist? Yes. How about this? Are miracles possible? Are miracles possible? Now, we, we get blocked out on that one, but <clears throat> what's the greatest miracle in the Bible, do you think? The greatest miracle would start with, how many uh, have this verse memorized? Some of you, we're going to talk about memorization in a minute. But the greatest miracle in the Bible is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You get that one locked down, everything else is okay, Right? If God created the heavens and the earth, he can take care of anything, right? He's got this dialed in. So are miracles possible? Just take the next step. There is a God. He created us. That's amazing. He created this world just right so we could live in it and be able to live in it. And he did it so precisely that we stay alive. You get it off a little bit, we die. But God created it in such a way, and that is a miracle, that's a miracle. Fourth question, and that's the one we're going to answer this morning in the time we have. So, does truth exist? The answer is, we all ultimately believe that. Does God exist? Even most scientists and philosophers have come to that conclusion today. That's the popular direction to go, because they can't explain life without a God. Then, are miracles possible? Turn to the person next to you and say, you are a miracle.
which is exactly true. Because God knew exactly your father and your mother, and he knew exactly who it would take to bring you into this world. And you are not just, uh, you are, you're one of a kind. You're not a diamond. You are one of a kind. There's only one you, and what a miracle you are. Personally, I wish God would have done a little bit better job on some of you. But anyway, you are a miracle. Just kidding. So, is the Bible true? Is the Bible true? To which everybody in the room says, because it's church, what do you say? <laughs> it better be. I got gotcha. you. We all say yes, but tomorrow morning, what do you think? Is the Bible still true on Monday morning? Is the Bible still true when you're in your workplace? Yep, and you spend a lot of time in your workplace. A witness is simply one who knows something and makes the knowledge available to others. A witness doesn't express their, what they think or what they feel or what I think this might have happened. I feel like that might be what's the cause. A witness says, this is what I know. And so when we come to the Bible, especially now we're sp- focused on the second half of the Bible, the New Testament, then there are witnesses, there's testimony to the fact that this book is reliable. So that's what I want to talk about, spend the most time this morning. Sound all right? Because I want to build up your faith. A while back, there was a uh, sergeant in the Marines, and his daughter loved Jesus with all her heart, and in high school, she, she led the uh, Bible clubs, and she was uh, reaching out to her friends and sharing Jesus she told her dad, Dad, I want to go to University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, when I uh, go to college. And so they arranged for that to happen. She wanted to go to college and share her faith in Christ. Six weeks into her first year, she calls Dad back and she says, Dad, I just want you to know I don't believe in God anymore. How come? Because there's a religion professor here, and he went to a big to do Ivy League school, and he said, you can't trust the Bible. Now, there are a lot of people with a PhD, and and no offense, if you got a PhD, I wish I had one, but there are a lot of people with a PhD, and they don't think very good. A doctorate. So, I'm going to give you this morning, because I've been doing some reading and homework, eight different testimonies to the validity of the Bible, particularly Jesus and the New Testament. The question, of course, to ask everybody in the room, and I appeal to you young people, man, if you can lock this down so that your life is not blown in the wind with every new idea and every new uh, pleasure that comes along, lock it down early that God has a special place for you and that the Bible verifies that. So, Um, Six, I'm just going to touch on six. One witness is the early testimony. It's the early testimony to the Bible. Most Most of the New Testament was written before 70 A.D., before 70 A.D., the, those things that were written by John are taken to be written after 70 A.D., but that leaves the Bible being written within 40 years of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And in those writings then they connect back to actual eyewitnesses that saw what took place, that they saw Jesus and that they saw him resurrected and, that they, and they bear witness to it in this book. That's called an eyewitness testimony or an early testimony. In other words, there's nothing like the Bible in having a close proximity from when it was written to what it's verifying that it's talking about. We take a lot of things for granted in history and it doesn't have nearly, not even close to the validity that the Bible has. So within 70 AD, most of the New Testament was written and it verified through eyewitnesses, through people who had actually seen what went on, that uh, Jesus is who he says he is. Second is eyewitness testimony. Different than early testimony, eyewitness testimony has to do with archaeology and other writings besides the Bible. In other words, they're still doing digs in the Middle East. They're, They're going in and they excavate. In fact, Uh, Within the last few years, if you check out John chapter 5, it talks about a uh, pool of water, and Jesus came to the man who had been uh, an invalid for 38 years, and the waters would be stirred. First one in the water gets healed. And it talked about this 
pool had five colonnades over it. So many years it's been that they thought that was just a storytelling because they couldn't find the five colonnades. So the fact of the matter is recent archaeology has uncovered, they got down far enough that they found that pool. Now those kind of things, there's, by the way, folks, there's been nothing discovered by archaeology or by science that would overrule the book. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. So that's the eyewitness testimony. By the way, through archaeology and other writings, there's 84 details in the book of Acts from 13 to 28 that can be verified. Other things other than the Bible. I could go on. Expected testimony. Expected testimony. Has to do with the first two-thirds of this book is called the what? Old Testament. The Old Covenant. And um, in the late 40s and the early 50s, there began some discoveries around the Dead Sea in the Middle East. In 47, uh, 1947, a shepherd boy happened to wander in and he found a cave. And in that cave, he found some documents. And then they began some searching around there. And in 11 different caves, they found documents they now call the Dead Sea Scrolls. And those scrolls are dated about 300 years before Christ. In fact, the whole book of Isaiah, 24-foot-long scroll, gives the whole book of Isaiah and, and confirms that these words were written prior to Jesus. And if you want to just take a look at the expected testimony, read today, later, Isaiah 52, 13, through Isaiah 53, 52 and 53, and think about it applying to the person of Jesus. You can't get much more precise. You cannot get more precise. So Isaiah 52 and 53. Get it? Extra biblical testimony. That simply means, aside from the Bible and, and we all saying that this is true, there are other writings that verify, that talk about Jesus and his disciples. Within the first 150 years, there are 10 source documents that talk about Jesus and his disciples. But the last two are the ones I would take a few mo moments on. Number five, how can we know that the Bible is true? It's, number five is embarrassing testimony. It's the principle of embarrassment. Those that study history and they look at the writings go, you know, if you were really writing this uh, and it wasn't true, you wouldn't make yourself, uh, you would make yourself look good. Now, um, my mom passed away a couple years ago, but it didn't matter how old I was. When I would go home to visit, mom would still tell stories about me when I was a little boy. And they were embarrassing. You know, I remember when you were standing in the sink, kitchen sink, Naked when I was washing you. <laughs> Mom, I, I'm 50. Give me a break. That's embarrassing. You know, or uh, I can remember, here's the picture. She brings out the pictures <laughs> where your sisters dressed you up like a girl. <laughs> I don't want these kind of things in my story. It's embarrassing, right? But when we look at the Bible, then we have the principle of embarrassment. And I will go through this as quickly as I can but I just want to give you some examples of the principle of embarrassment as it relates to the New Testament. Am I doing all right? Is this all right today? A little different. You okay? Embarrassing testimony. The New Testament writers write about how dim-witted they are. They're not very bright. Jesus is talking to them all the time, and they're going, do you get what he's talking about? I don't get it. He keeps talking about he's going to go and get, and get killed and that. What? And uh, so they tell the story on themselves that they're not too bright. So for those of you who go, I'm not too bright, you're in good company. You're right there with the disciples. I mean, they said, Jesus, explain it to us. I don't get it. I don't get it. So they told that about themselves. Number two, they uh, tell the story of, on themselves of not caring. How about Jesus in the garden on the last night of his life on the earth, and they kept falling asleep. Don't you care? Can't you watch for one hour? And they tell him the story that they kept falling asleep on him. I would have... Don't put that in there. That's embarrassing. Number three, when Jesus is killed, his followers, his friends that spent three years with him, they disappeared. There's no... Rec they're not even around to try and bury Jesus' body. They left that up to Joseph of Arimathea. Who was he? He was one of the religious leaders in Jerusalem. He was a Jewish, he was a follower of Jesus in secret because he didn't want his friends to know what was going on. And he stepped up. But his followers, those closest to him, 
they disappeared. They didn't even try and give him a decent burial. That's embarrassing. Number four is a good one because Jesus' body goes missing. Jesus was buried in a Jewish tomb and he was guarded, the body was guarded by a Roman guard. And later the followers of Jesus step up and they go, you know, Jesus is alive. Well, if Jesus wasn't alive, what would happen? Well, first of all, the Jewish people would go, hey, this is Joseph's tomb, and there's the body. But they couldn't even do that. So you know what they said? They said, let's make up a story. So you Roman guards, we're going to pay you off, and I want you to tell the story that you fell asleep, and while you were asleep, the disciples came and stole the body. Now, first of all, if the Roman guard fell asleep, they would be executed. They had a rotation of guards, and you wouldn't fall asleep. Secondly, that um, it's interesting that the religious leaders had to come up with the story of a stolen body. Why was that? Because they couldn't find the body. So not only, so you tell them, we'll pay you, that you fell asleep and that the disciples came. By the way, if you're asleep, how did you know that the disciples stole the body? All right, does this make sense? Number five, this is a biggie. Peter's friends, Matthew and Mark, they tell in their story that Jesus turned and called Peter Satan. Now, if I'm Peter, I'm going, guys, don't you love me? Don't put that in there. That's embarrassing. Jesus calls Peter Satan. Number six, Paul rebukes Peter in the book of Galatians. Peter is one of the leaders of the church, and Paul in public rebukes, rebukes Peter. Don't put that in there. Number seven, the disciples are cowards at first. They follow Jesus for three years. He gets killed, and they scatter. They go into hiding. And uh, Peter denies Jesus three times. The disciples run away. And who are the brave ones in the story? The women. The women. Yay, ladies. On the first day of the week, early in the morning, the ladies came to the tomb. The guys were still hiding out for fear. The ladies. Now, one lady suggested the reason it was ladies first is because the ladies would get the word out. We guys would go home and say, I've spoken enough today. <laughs> the ladies. Did you know in those days, the testimony of ladies was not respected? Interesting that it would be told in the book that the ladies were there first and they gave witness because in that day, it wasn't any respect to the testimony of the ladies. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, which was written before the Gospels, and you get the idea. Because Paul mentions all the people that saw Jesus, didn't mention one lady, not one. But the ladies were there first. Number nine, <clears throat> embarrassing testimony. The disciples are doubters. That's embarrassing. Even after Jesus was raised from the dead, they were still doubting. Number 10, Jesus' family thought he was a mental case. In Mark 3 and other, uh, in Matthew 12 and Luke, three different Gospels, it refers to his family coming to get him because he, he's off his rocker. Let's get him out of here. That's not good. In, in uh, number 11, John 6, and now these are things that don't, don't shine well necessarily on Jesus. In John 6, it says many of the followers, many of the disciples left Jesus. They said, this is getting too hard, and they walked out on him. Number 12, <clears throat> Jesus' own brothers do not believe in him. It says in the uh, Gospels, his own brothers. But did you know that there is a historian, his name is Josephus. He was a Jewish historian. He was not a believer. And he records in his history that James, the half-brother of Jesus, was martyred, that he was killed. That's recorded in a historian's viewpoint that wasn't trying to follow the Bible. Number 13, Jesus was labeled a deceiver. Jews said he was blaspheming. The Romans said it was treason. 
And Jesus is also called a madman, a drunkard, a demon-possessed man. He was cared for by fr- prostitutes, and he was cursed because he hung on a tree. Now, that's embarrassing testimony. You get it? That gives verification of how neat this book is, this special book. Excruciating testimony simply means this, out of the cross. And I will shorten it up just by saying this. <clears throat> out of, excruciating testimony out of the cross. Every one of the close followers of Jesus ultimately gave their life for the gospel of Jesus. They died for their faith. We're troubled about living for our faith. These people had something happen in their lives that was so amazing that they were willing to be killed for their faith. Whether it was James, whether it was um, Stephen, whether it was Paul, whether it was Peter, whether all of them, the only one that lived a long life and he suffered greatly is the Apostle John. All the rest were killed for their faith. That's called excruciating testimony. If somebody said, I believe this so much, I will die for it, do you think that's a pretty good testimony? Yeah, I think it is. So let me just... um, Why the dramatic change in these followers of Jesus? What happened that changed their mind? They were afraid, they ran, they fled, they scattered. And then, after a time, they were standing in the midst of Jerusalem declaring Jesus is alive. That's crazy. What happened? It's called an impact event. Now, some of you, how many of you are old enough to remember November 22nd, 1963? I remember, and do you remember where you were? Now, for those of you, what are you talking about? That was the day President Kennedy was assassinated. For those of us that were old enough to know that, boom, that's an impact event. We know what was going on. We know what was, where we were because on that day, something amazing, something terrible happened. How many remember where you were on uh, 9-11-01? How about... Uh, the earthquake, October 1989. Do you remember where you were? Yeah, bread, bread pudding. See, she's got it dialed in. So how many remember where you were on September 11th, 2011? Not registering. Not registering. I don't know. 2011. See, when there's an impact event that takes place in your life, you were all dialed in. We know where we were. We know what happened. We know what we were feeling. And that's what happened to the disciples. In other words, the impact event was Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. They went from being cowards to courageous because this is what they were before and now this is what they are afterwards. What did they have to gain by reporting the truth? Well, they gained excommunication from the synagogue. They were persecuted, they were beaten, they were jailed, and they were killed. Does that sound like a pretty good testimony for the validity of this book? The Bible is trustworthy. The Bible is trustworthy. Somebody uh, wrote this care card last week. How can I be sure, without doubt, that there is life after death. You know how you can be sure? Because those who wrote the story saw Jesus alive after he was killed. There is more testimony, there's more witness, there's more validity to this book going away than anything that's ever gone down in history. See, we don't have to back away. We're not taking a shot in the dark. We're not just blind leap in the leap of faith. We have a foundation where we can know the truth. We can know the truth. And so accept the authority of the Bible. How many would like me to finish the, uh, fill in the blanks? How many would like to go home? 
I would. <clears throat> Everybody, if you're gonna, if you're gonna, uh, if this is gonna mean something to you, accept the authority of the book. Accept the authority of the book. B is build the Bible into my life. Build the Bible into my life. Your trouble is that you don't know the scriptures and don't know the power of God. So let me just quickly give you five ways to build the book into your life. One is listen to the word. Listen to the word. It can be like this where you're reading long verses and you're hearing me talk. It can be putting the Bible on your iPod and listening to that, sticking, playing it in the car when you're driving around. Listen to the word. Second is read God's word. Read God's word. <clears throat> and here's what I ask you to do. How many here in the house believe that the Bible is God's word? Got it. So I want you to do 30 days of uh, spiritual discipline. I want to ask you that believe in the Bible if you would read three chapters a day for the next 30 days. Start with the book of Matthew and go, and in 30 days you'll read through all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 30 days, three chapters a day. I'd like you to put that on a card and, uh, and just, because it helps. We write it down, we make a commitment. So for the next 30 days, we're going to read through the New Testament. Did you know that the uh, Los Angeles Times newspaper, Sunday paper, has more words in it than the New Testament? It's amazing. Three chapters a day for 30 days. Would you do that? Because we want to read God's word. Next, uh, study God's word. The Bereans studied the scriptures every day. Quickly, how do you study the Bible? Very simply, you do it with a pen or pencil in hand. If you'll just do something writing, you can study. And the greatest help for me studying the Bible is a dictionary. That's my greatest tool, looking up definitions of words. Number four, memorize God's word. Memorize God's word. Your word, if I hid in my heart, wouldn't sin against you, put it in the depths of my heart. How many here cannot memorize the Bible? Could I see your hands? <laughs> no. no, this is a trap. <laughs> we memorize all sorts of things. I bet everybody in this room can quote Genesis 1-1. What does it say? See, you got it. You got a verse. You got a verse. You got to start. Number five is meditate on God's word. Focus thinking on the scriptures. What does this mean? Meditate on God's word. Always meditating. How many here in the room know how to worry? How many know how to worry? Uh, if somebody next to you did not raise their hand and you know that they worry, would you just point them out right now? Just point at them. Just point at him. I'm going somewhere with this. Worry, worry doesn't help anything. And worry is negative meditation. It is focused thinking on what will go wrong. It's focused thinking about worrying about what will come out of this. It's focused thinking because we get... Oh, 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 oh. So if you can worry, then you can turn it around and you can meditate your mind on truth. <clears throat> oh, I missed a little something here. Um, in knowing the Bible, there was a survey done at a high school not too long ago, and they were asking some uh, students what they knew about the Bible, and they, the students said that they thought Jesus was baptized by Moses. <laughs> they said the first four books of the New Testament, the Gospels, was Matthew, Mark, Luther, and John. <clears throat> They uh, thought the epistles were the wives of the apostles. <clears throat> and the last one's a good one. They thought Sodom and Gomorrah were lovers. <laughs> How many think we need to know the Bible? So I'm going to wrap it up with this. So A, accept the authority of the Bible. It is a th the authority for my life and build my life, build into my life the scriptures and see, choose to apply God's word to my life. Choose to apply God's word. Choose to apply God's word.
So here's my conclusion. How am I doing, D? Everything okay? Good. You get me on the way home? How many believe everything you read in the magazine rack going out of the grocery store? <laughs> Found two-headed alien. How many believe everything you read in a magazine? How many believe everything you read on other people's Facebook page? How many believe everything that you hear on the news? How many here believe everything that you see on TV and you're told through the TV? How many believe everything your friends tell you? How many believe everything that's written in this book? So let me ask you a question. We're all in it together, right? Why do we spend more time listening and reading things we don't believe than we do reading and studying something we do believe. You all right out there? And that's, the why, that's why we're getting creamed, because we don't know. We don't know. We don't know. So here is our finish. Choose to apply God's word. If you hear Jesus said my words and you do them, you're like an intelligent person that builds your house on the rock. So, I've already asked you to make a commitment to read three chapters a day for 30 days. Here's my conclusion. How many believe that this book is the authoritative word of God to us on how, on, on knowledge about what really is important, what really is life, and how to live our lives? Okay. How many here worry? <clears throat> a lie is an abomination to God and an ever-present help in time of trouble. So, there is a little book in the middle of the New Testament called Philippians. It's four chapters. Philippians 4, verse 6 says, Do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. So how many want to be doers of the word? So here's what I want to ask of you. Everybody that's wanting to be a doer of the word, be an intelligent person, I want you to practice praying, praying, so that the more we pray, the less worry we have. The less we pray, the more worry we have. Do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. So in your planner today is a little card. And it's asking you if you'd join us. And uh, how many here are worriers? How many are sitting next to a worrier? Point them out. Okay. I, I noticed that the hands are less up now there because it's going to be doing something. Well, this, we're just enjoying sitting here. We're not, we don't think we have to do anything when we leave. So I want to invite everybody that hasn't made a commitment, I want to ask you to Put that on a card and turn it in as you go. You can put it, give it to somebody, turn it in, put it in the box. But I want you to say, yep, I will pray uh, through the next 30 days. I will pray uh, each day as I'm reminded. Now, I have it on my computer, so it goes doing when, it's, when I've committed that time to pray. So uh, do not, how many can memorize scripture? Do not worry about You are memorizers coming out. You got it. You are brilliant. Now listen, how many men in this room are followers of Jesus? Amen. There's about a dozen of us. This is bad. This is bad. I know some of you don't like to uh, raise your hand in church. Deanna spoke at a early, earlier about coming together next Thursday night for prayer. And, um, you know, God Almighty invites us to partner with him to change our world. And we do it through prayer. So this is a little tool to help us go. And so on Thursday, I asked one of the ladies in the office, I said, can you give me a breakdown of, on this 
that people have signed up to pray at a certain time each day. Can you give me the breakdown between the ladies and the men? There are 86 names on this. 86 names. Would you join us? 66 are ladies. Men? Praise God for the 20. Yes. It only takes a few. How many here want to follow Jesus? Want to be intelligent people? Now, I'm not saying this as a bondage to you. I'm just saying it's a little tool because we're better together. We hold each other together, accountable, encourage one another. So I want, especially you men, to put down a time. Uh, just name it. Like it's, it, it, just put it down there. Now, don't be in bondage. If you might miss it, that's okay. But uh, I'm especially, uh, we're the Marines and we're looking for a few good men. You're not too old. You're not too young. I want to see your name on the card. Don't tell me about how much you want to be a follower of Jesus. And this is just a simple little thing. Now, it is time to go. I recognize that. Um, so um, I encourage you. Now, let me, can I give you just a few instructions on how to pray? As you leave today, you can get a little, um, you can get a, a Based on the Lord's Prayer, you can get a little prayer guide and some people to pray for. Here's what I do. So when your time comes, first of all, don't worry about the clock. Don't, like I don't wear a watch, but obviously you can tell that. But um, So it's my time to pray, and I get down on my knees, I encourage you to do that. And I, I put my face into the chair. Obviously, I close all the doors I can behind me because I don't want anybody watching me. And uh, I get down and kneel down. Kneeling is good. If you can kneel, you should kneel. And then I simply uh, pray through the Lord's Prayer and I pray inside out. I pray from those closest to me and I pray out. And I pray through this. Now, all you need to do is start praying, but don't worry. If you... You, if by the time you, you go, I've run out of things to pray for, and you look down, it's been 30 seconds. At, at least you got started. It's okay. Don't be panicked about, oh. Are you all right, Doug? Guys, you getting this? So what I do is uh, pray an inside out, and then I'll take this prayer list. People have been turning their prayer requests, and I'll just go through and call each name and, and the need. If you just do that, it'll be amazing. You'll look and you've prayed for 15, 20 minutes. But it's okay. Just pray when the buzzer goes off and don't worry if you don't make it 15 minutes. Just pray. How many want to be intelligent people? How many want your house built on the rock? Then I'm looking for you to turn in your cards, especially men. And if I don't see your card, I'm coming after you. <laughs> in Jesus' name, let's stand together. Oh, my goodness. I've been studying for three weeks on this, and you can tell. Okay, this is the foundation, and in a couple weeks, we'll talk about, uh, we'll get some hot topics like hell. <laughs> and uh, When you run into somebody who says they can't believe in the God you believe in, there's two questions you can ask. One is, if I ask you a spiritual question, would you be straight on, honest? And if they say yes, then if I can show to you that Jesus is for real and the Bible is for real, then are you willing to follow Jesus? Now, when people say no at that point, it's not a matter of their thinking, it's a matter of their heart. It's an attitude that they have about what life is and what really matters. Because we can know, we can know, we can know. Don't be timid, we can know. Heavenly Father, thanks for this time and thank you so much for each one that's here today. I pray that we would take this book called the Bible 
and that we would accept this book as the authority for our life. Lord, help us to not worry about the things we don't understand. Help us to focus on following you and following your instructions for life in the areas we do understand. Forgive us, Lord, for worrying more than we pray. Help us, Lord, to have an appetite, to to create an appetite for reading your book. May we build this book into our lives more and more. And I pray that we would choose daily to apply this book as it comes up. Apply this book to our lives in following you. I'm so grateful for everyone in this room. I pray for those that are here today and they do not know who Jesus is. They do not know what it means to have that experiential knowledge of walking with God. I pray that they would this day begin to open up their heart and consider the claims of Jesus, who you are and what those closest to you declared about you and they gave their lives to prove it. Thank you for your favor and blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining with us today in our live streaming of our service and our message. We're grateful that you joined with us. And if we can serve in any way, we'd be glad to do that. Just check out our website. That'll get you connected in any way that you might like to. And uh, that is greenvalleychurch.net. And we wish you the best and know that you really do matter to God. Have a great day.